Welcome back, uh, week seven of our course. And uh, today we want to look at uh, theological perspectives on calling and commitment and make some connections uh, to professional life of nurses and, and the rest of us as well. Uh, when we talk about the words calling and commitment, we're talking about two sides of a coin. Calling um, is a s sense of hearing something uh, you know, from somewhere else from our society or even from the Lord, uh, where we feel like there's something to respond to. Commitment is what happens inside when we go ahead and decide that. And, uh, um, and so uh, that's basically what we're, we're looking at. Uh, we begin then um, by uh, some uh, sort of, not definitions, but some descriptions. Uh, Calling, uh, in the sense that we're talking about it, is the, a sort of a primary vocation, the primary work uh, to which we're called. Uh, if I have a calling to teach, or uh, you have a calling to, uh, in healthcare, uh, <clears throat> someone may have a calling uh, in uh, in other areas, in uh, in uh, you know primary education uh, or uh, in other places of service. And uh, the assumption is that it has a personal value, right? <laughs> so, I remember my mom once saying the, uh, 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 that uh, she, she was lauded, she was, thanked, she, she was thanked in church for helping out at some uh, uh, publication they were doing and, uh, you know, uh, at how, the, uh, how they, they'd heard the calling of the Lord and responded. And, and she said to me afterwards, she says, my calling is not to lick envelopes. <laughs> but, <laughs> so she was a little tired of that language. Calling, in the sense that we're talking about it, is a primary call. And then we, we sense the personal value of, of, of what that is. And sometimes uh, we even feel it in an urgency that is, uh, that is not uh, negotiable. Uh, sometimes our calling gets us into trouble uh, because of the strength in which we feel it. Um, and, uh, and that's just a part of what it is to be a human being and, uh, and in response to uh, the realities around us. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm working down the outline and I hope you are uh, looking at that as well so you can see uh, I'm not entirely rambling but we're heading in a certain direction. Point two then, um, being called to a calling. What's, what's involved there? Calling does imply being called by. Uh, we, usually don't, we usually don't call ourselves uh, to something. Uh, possibly we're called by a community, a shared community. We are in, uh, in an environment and we realize, you know, this place really needs a coffee house. So we're called to, to, to do that. Uh, sometimes it comes from the shared values of family. Uh, there are many people who are in healthcare whose uh, mother or father were, was in, were in healthcare and, um, and they see the value of that. And so they respond in a sense of, of the shared values of a community or a family in that sense. Other callings come from, um, from an ideal. Uh, the ideals we hold, say humanitarian ideals or the political ideals of our nation, and we're called into a political area uh, or called to serve uh, in politics uh, or called to serve um, anywhere. Uh, because we see the value of, of, of and, and we understand that perhaps we can uh, contribute and we would like to contribute. From a Christian perspective, calling is definitely the calling that God places on our lives. We, we, we sense uh, a call to God and what he wants us to do. And that's it's a very nice context because it implies that the, the calling itself is something that will be good for us. Uh, as well, and, and we certainly hope hope that it will be. So, uh, yeah, calling then something has called us, uh, and it also implies then that we we accept the call. Um, and in doing so, I mean, just to look at what these terms mean, right? It means we are obliged to others uh, in the call. If our calling is to set up the the best community coffee shop for this uh, town then uh, we're obliged to, I mean, we, we, we want customers, but we want a sense that they want a sense that we're for them and uh, all of that. Uh, we're, we're obliged um, to others. So calling is not based in our individualism. Um, you know, sometimes it is, or sometimes when we're younger, we, uh, you know, I'm called to write poetry. 
or maybe just for the moment, <laughs> maybe not as a, as a, as a social uh, contribution. Maybe so, though. Uh, but a calling is not just an individual sense of, of what I'm going to do, but it has to, it's a, it's, a, it's a response to what is out there. And if we connect it with some of the language that we've used in the past about what it is to be a, a person, uh, we are created in needfulness, in blessed needfulness. Uh, calling is something we need. We, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a joyful uh, task to, to become involved in that obligation to others. Uh, and if we are frustrated in that call, we lose a job, uh, or can't find our place um, in, in, in how things work, uh, then, uh, then we feel a loss. Uh, humanly, we begin to feel uh, uh, as if something's missing. I mean, we think of, yeah, uh, people losing their jobs. I, I think also of some of my younger friends who are just coming out of college um, and who are in the arts. They're finding that our society doesn't value the arts as much as they wish they would. And so they're struggling to find positions in orchestras uh, or ways in which to, uh, to promote a writing or a theater uh, calling. Uh, and it becomes, uh, it becomes difficult. But that's part of the fact that in our personal call, the individual sense of call, it places us uh, in context and in needfulness to, with others. Uh, uh, and, and their own needfulness as well. Uh, that implies, uh, especially as a call becomes formalized, uh, the call needs to be confirmed, right? It needs to, someone has to say, yes, you're a teacher. Uh, yes, uh, you're a nurse. Uh, yes, um, uh, you have a great coffee shop. <laughs> yes, you make good coffee. Uh, and, and so, there is a chance of being sustained in that church, in that fellowship, in that community, in that healthcare system. Somebody offers you a job, somebody pays you, and so it becomes uh, a living. And it's, uh, it's that response of the individual to the community, and the community says, yes, we need you, and we need your call, uh, and we need, to, we need you to, to satisfy it. Uh, I worked, uh, <clears throat> served uh, a few years ago in our church, Presbyterian Church, uh, on the pastoral nominating committee. And uh, that was fascinating to, uh, for the committee. And in a Presbyterian Church, they have a lot of freedom to, to, to review. We reviewed about 70 or 80 applicants and uh, boiled it down to one. Uh, and at the point that we offer them the job, um, that is, in the Presbyterian Church, that is officially, the document is described as the call. That's the call. So they feel the call, but we respond and, uh, and confirm that that individual is called as we understand it in our prayer and uh, in our discernment of the Spirit. That individual is called uh, to be uh, at our, uh, our, our church. And so there is that reciprocity, right, in the individual uh, uh, with, with society. Um, we are suspicious of, just to stay with the area of healthcare, people who set up their own shingles and they don't have, uh, they have not been uh, authorized. No school has said, yes, uh, you are a physical therapist. <laughs> you know, yes, you are a, a cancer specialist. And yet they start uh, uh, prescribing and, and, and pretend that they are. That's a problem. Uh, that is, uh, that's a, a failure of the reciprocity and, and of the process. So th that exists, okay? It's got the strengths and weaknesses, uh, but being called to a calling means that there is a response on the part of those who we think we're called to, and, uh, and they, uh, they affirm that. And so that brings us to the, the last point of point number two, uh, for that reason, calling involves these things. It involves a partnership. It involves finding a team and working on a team. Uh, if, we are, if we have our resumes out, we're looking for a job, uh, you know, we're hoping they're looking at our qualifications, uh, and they do at first, but if it gets down to the last five applicants, uh, we are told, we're reminded what they're looking for is someone who will be a team member. Will you fit in with the people who are doing other aspects of, of the work 
and they're probably looking for not only qualifications but for uh, maybe some emotional strengths as well. Uh, so calling does involve finding and working in a team. Uh, in that sense, um, it involves relationship. And when I say relationship, I'm talking about covenant relationship. It means um, the, the proper working together in terms of what, uh, what we have decided to do. Uh, and uh, we're not saying it involves necessarily a personal relationship, but sometimes we want to stay away from those in the work environment. But uh, certainly a professional relationship uh, that, uh, that has a definite meaning. Uh, but thirdly, uh, we're implying, too, that calling involves affirmation. Uh, if I'm called to teach, I better find someone who says, yes, and we want you to teach at our school. So uh, affirmation, uh, and, and I, I'm needing that, right? I, or to say it in different language, I am needful for that. A sense of call, but that affirmation from the other side as well. But fourthly, because it's partnership, because it's relational, because it's mutual, it also involves development. This is a, uh, it's something that we, I don't just get everything in my call, everything I know how to do in terms of teaching. I learn as I go, as I learn the people that I'm connecting with, I'm learning the, the environment of teaching, the professional environment, the, the political legal environment, you know, but also the ways in which uh, our learners uh, are, are ready to hear. So uh, development, and it's obvious in nursing as well, uh, the constant search for best practices uh, and the constant uh, research and uh, everything else that goes into uh, how can we do this best because of our call. Because of our call, therefore, there must be development and suffice it to say that this also requires uh, a profound and deep ethic in terms of that development. All right, let's look at uh, a scripture where we uh, look at it from the Christian point of view uh, and what do we have uh, in that sense in the New Testament and I'm going to go with uh, uh, got a lot of passages you could look at, uh, but I find Second uh, Thessalonians, uh, chapter one, verses eleven and twelve, uh, to be uh, to be very helpful. Uh, yeah, it's a very small uh, letter of Paul's to a very small congregation, uh, but he had something profound to say to them, and uh, so let's look at that together. Let me read that passage. To this end, we will always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we see here? Uh, the prayer is that God make you worthy of the call. May God make us worthy of his call. This is a call, uh, in this context, it's not, a, it's not a, like a secular, it's not a professional call. It's a call to be a Christian and all that that involves. And um, that's one perspective for, for Christians to understand and, and pick up. To be a Christian is to have a call to be a Christian. Uh, in all the ways that that uh, entails. Uh, in, uh, it's a, that means it's a developing challenge. I, I hope you, if you're a Christian, <laughs> you understand that. It's something that, uh, that causes our best uh, efforts uh, day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, and, uh, and, and causes reflection. I think that's the genius of getting together on a Sunday morning is that we be challenged afresh uh, with the, uh, what, what God has called us into. And, uh, and so the, the developing challenge uh, of being a Christian is, is there. It means uh, being called in community, and that's very much Paul's language here. Uh, he says, you know, we pray for you uh, as you uh, are participating in the community. Um, so, uh, and I would say, uh, 
<clears throat> Paul is thinking, especially when he says, may Christ be glorified in what you do, not that you be, uh, have your, be patted on the back, but, uh, but, that, but, that, but that Jesus uh, be manifested in you. Paul is definitely thinking of them, not just an isolated Christian community, but they are people who are working and living in Thessalonica as well. And uh, they have a witness, they have connection. They are serving the, whatever community they're in. So uh, uh, this is not an isolated, walled community of, of believers. Um, but people who are generous in their time and efforts and, um, and looking to see uh, what can be done uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the city that they, they live in. So uh, may God make you worthy of his call and, and that he will fulfill, this is again the prayer of Paul, that he will fulfill by his power every good resolve of yours and work of faith. May he fulfill with his power. So here uh, is the prayer. Uh, it's the implication that we ourselves cannot, in fact, make ourselves worthy of the call of God. It's a pretty steep call uh, to love God and love each other uh, without borders or, uh, or any hesitation. I, I find a challenge in that every day. Uh, but it is a call. Uh, and so the prayer is that God sustain us in that and increase our uh, abilities in that uh, and lead us in that. And, um, and so uh, it's profoundly uh, a sense of God's presence with us while that's happening. Um, I, uh, it's, it's also God's affirming of our call. You know, who God is. He wishes us to uh, to understand uh, what it is and to grow in that. And, uh, and, and that's uh, powerful as well. I like uh, the, the saying of St. Augustine, which I have uh, put here in, in my, sort of my own translation. Uh, Augustine, again, praying to God, he says, ask whatever you will of me and supply whatever you ask of me. Ask whatever you will, but supply, provide me. Make me sufficient for what, whatever you ask. Yeah, that's quite a prayer. And I think that's very much in line with Paul's, uh, Paul's prayer here as well. Going on uh, again, looking down, uh, coming down the outline. Um, that we, he, God will fulfill uh, <clears throat> by his power every good resolve and work of faith. So uh, really, this is to, to, to God is, is, is being called upon to make effective uh, the things that we do that are actually good, that are in God's goodness, that are right and, and, and appropriate. Uh, may God supply the, the effort that that, happen, that, that, that that works. May God supply uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of what we do. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. Again, not for us to get the credit, because if it's God who's done it, we just have to say, you know, thanks for letting us you know, be witnesses. We get a chance to see what you do, Lord God. There's also the possibility that we won't see the effectiveness, right? I mean, uh, you know this. Um, we do good and we don't know what we've done until we see someone in the hall who's there two years later. They're with a, with a, I don't know, family member and they say, you know, you really helped me on a certain day. The fact that, that you just smiled and, uh, and, and were who you were made such a difference in my life uh, and, uh, and in my healing process. I just thought, well, I'm turning a corner and I just appreciate the help of this nurse so much. That happens, that happens. And uh, nurses, I think, are lucky in that, that they hear uh, that it happens more often than, uh, than perhaps people do in other uh, callings. Um, but there's that as well. If God is making it effective, then we can't expect to see exactly how effective we were all the time. That that is also a part of faith, of, of allowing our life to be lived in God's love. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and ultimately, our obedience then uh, to God and to, uh, and to the task, rather than to, to, to the seeing of results necessarily. But I thank God the times that he has allowed me to glimpse the results of, of something that I've done. That's always also quite affirming. So uh, 
Fourth point, finally, the calling is uh, that in all we do, Jesus is glorified. This is specific for Christians, uh, that, that uh, our work is ultimately and always so that Jesus might be glimpsed in it. He is not always glimpsed in our work, but there are times that he is with or without our awareness. And that is the height, and that is the call. That is the call. For Christians, that is the call. Uh, that uh, something of God's love be sensed in us, even if we are doing something fairly mechanical, something we do all the time, uh, something that we're not specifically focused on, uh, you know, may God be, be glorified. I like the, the, uh, the, the phrase, too, uh, that Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. This points, I think, to the profound satisfaction of our calling uh, when, when it's pursued correctly. It doesn't mean there's not burnout for occasionally or frustration, or there are times when we want to throw in the towel. Uh, but, um, but, but when it flows and when it works, uh, it's, it's profoundly satisfying. And what that means is that we are linked with God. We sense God's presence. and. Uh, and someone else can sense God's presence in us. Uh, there's that opportunity. It's that prayer. It's that reality of the Christian life that uh, that, that can happen. And, um, and that should be the reason for our response to the call, according to Paul. Six, uh, fifth point here on, on the outline, the calling then require, uh, requires excellence beyond our power that God will support. Yes, uh, I suspect I don't have to make the argument with you whether or not you have a strong relationship with a higher power. You know uh, that, uh, that occasionally we're called to excellence and we didn't know it was there. Uh, we're grateful that it happens and if somebody benefits from it. And um, yeah, when we talk about excellence, uh, we're a definite connection to the, to the whole area of ethics, which is obviously very important to this course. And then to just summarize, uh, or to call back to the, to the four uh, nouns that we had further up. So in Christian community, or in any community, but specifically now, to speaking of Paul's Christian community, uh, we see these four elements. We see the partnership of, of needing to be connected. We see relationship of it happening in terms of mutual commitment. We see affirmation as God says yes to us while he's saying yes through us to other people. Uh, And we see the need for development. Um, It's not, we are not called as Christians to to sit back in a self-satisfied lifestyle, but uh, in the moment we are Christians, we, we immediately are called and we're called to each other we call to others uh, in the name of, uh, of the Lord. So I think that's um, one way to capture some of the particular challenges and affirmations of the, uh, the language of calling in the New Testament. Just to glance a little bit at the history of, of the idea uh, since then, you have a lot of uh, thought and concern about calling in, uh, in the early uh, church era in the first 500 years and then later in the medieval period. Uh, it has to do with uh, special callings, really. You have the a whole sense of a literature of calling to monasticism. What does it mean to be called to a particularly holy life or called to church leadership as a, as a priest uh, or uh, in some other uh, form? And so, I mean, it, it has to do then with, with religious callings within Christianity. It's at the Reformation when the, when the Protestant Church uh, <clears throat> makes its own uh, place alongside the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, and uh, with a part of their insight or an aspect of their insight. And of course, this is picked up by everyone. I mean, it's not controversial, but it suddenly becomes a possibility to say that, in fact, um, calling is something that relates to a Christian's work outside the church a Christian's work in the world. And I'm going to read a passage from John Calvin uh, how, and how he uh, talks about this. Uh, Since God's blessing is potentially on any form of labor, 
from this we, we may be consoled that no task will be so sordid or base, provided you obey your calling in it, that it will not shine and be reckoned very precious in God's sight. So uh, any form of labor, uh, as, as we respond to it as a calling, none is so base. You know what? I'm not sure I could be a nurse <laughs> because of the things you do. Uh, I'm getting older. My wife is getting older. More and more we're doing those things for each other. Uh, but it's uh, uh, my hat is off to you. Uh, uh, and perhaps, um, I mean, it's something that uh, goes right back to Florence Nightingale, isn't it? She said, uh, any nurse should be ready to, to mop the floor. She said, even though perhaps it shouldn't always, <laughs> always be the nurse supervisor, but the nurse supervisor should be ready if necessary. Yeah, <laughs> I love that, love that uh, uh, quote of hers. <clears throat> uh, any form of labor. It can be a calling to God, a calling, a response to God, or if we'd want to say to uh, uh, the ideals uh, that are at the base of, at the heart of our uh, personal philosophy. Um, so long as, Calvin says, so long as in it, you obey your calling. You obey your calling. Uh, it is not sordid, okay? It is not base. Um, and not only that, but the result is that you will benefit, you will benefit. As God understands the, uh, the sacrifice entailed, as God understands the, uh, the power of, of what's being done, uh, or we could say uh, society as a whole may or may not appreciate powerfully what you're doing nevertheless. Uh, as we live out our call in that context, and sometimes we need to be very, we end up <laughs> being very specific. Do I really need to do that? <laughs> um, in obeying our call, it will always benefit ourselves in that broad context of the community work and of the work we're called to do. So let me pick up the idea of commitment now a little bit. Uh, we've looked at it to some degree. We talked about call and our response to call. But uh, commitment itself is, is worth uh, looking at. And I'm going to start with a passage in Romans 12. Let me just tell you about where this passage fits in uh, to, uh, to Paul's uh, letter. Paul has just explained uh, a lot of theology about what it means uh, that God came to find us, that he sent his son to die for us that we respond and respond to his grace, not by works, but by, uh, by faith, saying, yes, thank you, uh, God, and now help me live. And at verse 12, then, uh, he says, let's talk about that life. Uh, sorry, at chapter 12, he says, let's talk about that life. Let's talk about what that means. And um, what is remarkable and what I hope you hear as I read this passage uh, is that... Uh, the new life we're called to is, first of all, um, a commitment to present ourselves to God. And then secondly, it's not, okay, uh, just to sit in the pew on a, on a Sunday morning or, uh, or to be satisfied with the fact that we've found some individual personal joy, but he launches right in to the, uh, the, the, the need and the, and the joy the, of serving each other in dynamic community. So um, that's what... Uh, what I hear uh, in, uh, in Paul. He calls us immediately into, uh, into loving service. Um, and, uh, and that's what the commitment is all about. Let me read then Romans 12 and um, sections, okay? Not everything, but sections of uh, verses one through 14. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
For as, as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of another. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I mean, it's quite a commitment. Uh, the call is to serve the Lord, and the commitment is astonishingly complex and deep, and uh, uh, and and has all of those uh, all of those elements. So, commitment again is the other side of the coin. Call comes to us. Commitment is our our response in the con Christian context to. to be a Christian is to have a call. To be a Christian is to give our hearts and minds to God and in, and in service of God, knowing that's where our satisfaction is, knowing that where is, is where we will also be affirmed and, uh, and strengthened. Again, uh, the integrity is in obeying uh, the call. It's in saying yes. Uh, it's in our dedication and the Lord's promises, and, and whether we see that happen is not uh, as much to the, to the point. Commitment, again, is communal and corporate. It's something that happens in community. It's something that happens in a body. And uh, I, again, uh, point to Florence Nightingale's leadership. Uh, she pulled teams of nurses together uh, and understood that, uh, um, that reality. Let me just, uh, at this point, then look at some biblical examples of calls. Um, calls, I'm going to look at three. Uh, we'll look together at Isaiah's call uh, and, uh, and the call to Mary to respond to, uh, to God's wishes. And then Paul's call, uh, very different calls and in different contexts, but I think it may just sort of fill out our sense of, uh, of how call comes and, and what it entails uh, in the, the short run and the long run. Isaiah 6 gives us the call of Isaiah. So 1 through 5, you could ask what's there if he's called in 6. So read it and find out. But uh, in call 6, he says, this is what happened. This is how the Lord called me and I responded. And it begins with a, uh, Isaiah is just in the temple, not sure what he's doing. Um, <clears throat> maybe he's just sweeping the floor, I don't know, or or refilling the, uh, the little pencils in the pews or something like that. He's in the temple, he's by himself, and suddenly the Lord is there in, in all holiness. Um, and uh, so, uh, so he, he is shocked because the Lord in power with seraphim and cherubim, uh, and he feels the distance between himself and God. And, uh, and so I'm beginning to read then Isaiah 6, uh, beginning with 5. And I'll go through verse 10. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, having taken a live coal that had been taken from the altar and a pair of t with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. That's the, I hadn't finished reading, but I'll comment that that's the call. Uh, I don't know how you could say no to a call like that. God massively filling the uh, sanctuary. You're the only person there. And he says, I, I got someone. I got to send a message. Who shall I send? <laughs> well, there was nobody else there. Uh, but uh, Isaiah obviously feeling the, the strength and the power of that moment. And all, with all his heart sent me. And then God describes the task to which he's send, sending Isaiah. And it's not unpleasant at all, in fact. 
He's sending Isaiah to prophesy judgment. So a message that no one will want to hear. So continuing 9 through 10. And he said, Go and say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not comprehend. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears, so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their hearts and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. He said, I want you to preach the word of God, and it means that they will not listen to you. It means that they will, in fact, have judgment placed on them. Uh, it's a pretty harsh um, calling. Um, it reminds me, actually, of uh, the times I've uh, had physical therapy, and my wife has, uh, how often they have said, do these exercises <laughs> every day, three times a week. How often I don't. And how, uh, how, how disappointing that must be for the physical therapist. The good ones just say, well, that's okay. Let's work on it this week. Um, perhaps uh, with nurses also, there are those times, there are the communities where there's a desire to educate, a desire to lift uh, in health, and there is, in fact, no desire to hear the depth of what's being said, to change diet, stop smoking, uh, to, uh, uh, to relinquish and to, to look for a freedom from drug addiction. Uh, and there is no willingness to hear. And yet, God says to Isaiah, if you are my guy, this is what you gotta say, because there's no other message. Now, uh, Isaiah was successful. I mean, he, he was appreciated by his community because they kept his book, right? They didn't throw it away. Somebody knew it was valuable. And, uh, and we can uh, uh, appreciate that aspect of it. But what a call. I mean, what a call that was. Uh, Isaiah said yes, and he spent his life uh, pursuing that. Let's look at uh, the call of Mary, who uh, <clears throat> was minding her own business one day. And again, uh, suddenly arrives not uh, a vision of God, but the angel Gabriel shows up. And... Um, and let's hear what happens. Uh, we often think of Mary as being uh, a perfect example of faith, and she is. But how she's an example is, I think, also very helpful. We, we hear the, the total surprise of the moment, her own perplexity and questioning, which then finally results in her absolute acceptance of what is, uh, what, what is being said. So I'm, I'm looking at Luke 1. Uh, reading um, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, and this uh, actually reference to um, her uh, cousin Elizabeth's conception. So Elizabeth is six months uh, conceived. And uh, in the sixth month, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. So there's another call, another astonishing call. Um, 
I can't even imagine uh, what it would be uh, to be called in this way for this purpose. But she responds, she accepts. Uh, we read in uh, Matthew that her uh, husband doesn't accept it uh, until the angel also visits him and says, it's really okay, this is the work of God. And then he's on board and he becomes a great dad. Uh, but, uh, but what an astonishing um, uh, call this is. Uh, the total surprise, acceptance of that other reality. God is calling. Uh, the perplexity, she's not just, uh, you know, mechanically saying, oh, okay, whatever you say. She's responding in her humanity. She's ask, ask, asking very specific and re relevant questions. How can this be? Because, you know, I'm a virgin. Don't know if God told you that. Uh, and, uh, and the response, uh, this is the work of God because nothing is impossible with God. And she comes to a point where she can accept it completely, and she does. Uh, and this certainly is uh, a, an astonishing picture of the power of, of faith. A third example um, in the call of Paul, the apostle, very famous call, uh, well known in scripture. Uh, Paul was, uh, had never met Jesus, but he lived in Jerusalem. And he was one of the Pharisees, uh, one of the group that was so hostile to Jesus. And he was very hostile to the early Christians. He, he felt that the, what they were saying was in fact blasphemous. And he was present and, uh, and conspired in uh, the death of the first martyr, Stephen, by, by stoning there in Acts chapter six. And then we read uh, Paul wished to go to in fact uh, kind of snuff out the early Christian movement in other towns as well. So he just went off to Damascus up to the north uh, in order to, uh, uh, to bring what he thought was justice uh, to, the, to the Christian church, uh, meaning uh, uh, extinction. <laughs> and, uh, and so he set off and I'll, I'll read uh, passages in, uh, in chapter uh, nine of Acts, beginning with verse, um, Let's see, 1 through 7, and then uh, 15 and 16. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked him, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And, and Paul does that. He's obedient, right? Uh, amazing response. He says, who are you, Lord? <laughs> he got the name right, <laughs> but uh, he's still uh, astonished. Uh, and so God calls him. God says, this is not blasphemy. God says, this is what I'm doing. And he sends Paul to, uh, uh, and Paul, at that point, we say, he's obviously, uh, he's suddenly entered a new religious reality. And then verses uh, 15, 16, um, <clears throat> there's a man in, uh, Damascus called Ananias. The Lord has to go to him too and say, look, you won't like this, but there's a guy named Paul. You may have heard of him. He's coming and I want you to receive him as a brother. I want you to receive him as a community member. And Ananias uh, also objects. He says, yeah, no, I've heard the stories. Are you sure about this? And the Lord responds with these, these words. The Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So an astonishing, again, an amazing call. A couple of points I will make. As soon as Paul responds to Jesus, he's not only given a new life, he's given a call. Uh, and amazingly, it is specifically involving suffering, suffering. So, uh, well, I don't want to press these um, <clears throat> lessons too strong. Uh, you can pick up what you're going to pick up. Calls that the Lord bring are not always him showing up. 
uh, and uh, us being knocked down on the ground by any means. Um, the call of the Lord is to the things of the Lord, and that's always going to involve sacrifice, and I think we see that in that sense in each of the examples here. Let me uh, finish, not come, come toward the end, uh, by reading a couple of nursing pledges. Uh, one, uh, Florence Nightingale's own pledge, and then secondly, uh, the, uh, the nursing pledge that APU uses at our pinning ceremonies as, uh, as our uh, BSN graduates uh, become uh, RNs. So from Florence Nightingale, I'm not going to comment much on this, but I want you to hear uh, and I hope that you will uh, hear some of the things that we've been talking about. Florence Nightingale, I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. I will abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous and will not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug. I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession and will hold in confidence all, person, all personal matters committed to my keeping and all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. With loyalty, I will endeavor to aid the physician in his work and to devote myself to the welfare of those committed to my care. Devote myself to the welfare. And secondly, uh, and you have there the, before you the, the printed version of the APU uh, pledge. In full knowledge of the obligations I am undertaking, I promise to care for the sick with all the skill and understanding that I possess without regard to race, creed, color, politics, or social status sparing no effort to preserve the quality of life, to alleviate suffering, and to promote health. I will respect at all times the dignity and religious beliefs of the patients under my care, holding in confidence all personal information entrusted to me, and refraining from any action which may endanger life or health. I will endeavor to keep my professional knowledge and skill to the highest level and to give loyal support and cooperation to all members of the health team. I will do my utmost to honor the International Code of Ethics applied to nursing and to uphold the integrity of the professional nurse. So a lot there in both of them. Uh, and let me just... Uh, finally, in conclusion, give a few comments. You know, I think calling uh, is a simple thing. If we know it and experience it, uh, and commitment is a simple thing. Either you commit or you don't. The complexity and the difficulty comes as we move into it and to understand our own complexity in doing something so simple as being there for someone else. So I think the challenge uh, for me is, first of all, to understand the profound simplicity, to remember the profound simplicity of simply saying yes and, and what it, then it means, uh, as well as the, the complexity to, to follow through. But also then to understand everything that's involved, the growth, the learning, uh, the self-sacrifice, the commitment not only to, to myself and to my clients, but also to build the profession in its best way uh, and all that's entailed there in, uh, in saying yes.